Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. I want to welcome yeah. everybody to our Sunday night series and tonight we're extremely fortunate to have Ray speak about, Ray Uzana speak about his book, uh, Faces and Places of the Deep South. Now in this book uh, Ray takes the reader on his 2015 journey through America's South. He visits towns that are really mired in poverty and those that were involved in the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century. It's mostly a book about people and what the author, what Ray says, is calls the human wealth of the region. He recounts his journey through the Mississippi Delta and he writes of the blues heritage which nurtured talents like Charlie Patton and the Rolling Stones and Aretha Franklin, among others. And through his photography, he captures the mood and the feeling of the people and where they live. Geez, you said that a heck of a lot better than I could ever say. <laughs> Where'd you get that from? You got this from all your books. So anyway, he left the corporate world. This is what he tells me anyway. He left the corporate world as CEO of Amplex Corporation to pursue another world of writing, photography, and adventure. So without further ado, you're on, Ray. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you all coming. Uh, I have a lot I want to share with you, so I really would like to get right to the subject. As Susan mentioned, in 2015, I motored down through the Deep South. Not once, not twice, actually went three times. Uh, the first time we're living on a bitter cold February day. Uh, the last few days we were down in a small Alabama town where the temperature was up around 100 degrees for each of the five days I was there. But during those trips, once I got to South Carolina, it was the back roads, the secondary, the tertiary roads through South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas. And when everything was said and done, the product of that, those trips was this book. Now, uh, rest assured, I'm not here to sell the book by any means. It's actually a very expensive book because of the photographs and the paper, but each of the libraries in the area have a copy if anybody wants to learn more about it. But uh, my little, a little bit of a dilemma I have here is that there's really three themes in the book. Any one of them could occupy the next 45 minutes, but we're not going to do that. We've got what I call the abject poverty of the region. We've got the, you know, this is an area where, which was the birth and nurturing of the modern civil rights movement of our country. And lastly, you know, you can't talk about the Deep South, particularly the area of Mississippi, without talking about the music, the blues. Uh, in the book, I cover a lot more of that. Uh, for purposes of the talk, I think the pictures will speak well enough for the, what I call the poverty. Uh, the, the music part, uh, I'll talk a little bit about it at the end, but I really want to focus on these places and the people I met. Uh, that was so germane to what's been happening, what has happened uh, in terms of the civil rights movement. Uh, now, what I want to do with you, and I, I love the venue here, I love the intimacy, I want to take you along with me on this trip. The photographs you're going to see are not meant to be a dog and pony show by any means, but they are meant to complement what I'm going to tell you and vice versa. Uh, most of these photos, including the one here, uh, I was up at first light, driving on a, on a trip. The back is a, it's a, a cotton field that's been plowed under, but the light is because the sun's just coming up. This was just a little patch of, uh, of cotton along the side of the road. A lot of the pictures you're going to see are that. So I think you could place yourself as a passenger in my car for most of this. 
<laughs> and appreciate the drive through, the people that we meet, the places. There are stories about them. Now, in, for purposes of, our, of our, my talk here, I'm not going to be able to go into the detail with all of them that I would like to. There's a couple that I will because I think they're so uh, relevant and should be of interest to all of you. So why don't, uh, uh, I guess, buckle up your seat, pretend you're in that passenger seat of mine, and let's, let's, take, that, uh, let's take that ride. Uh, maybe you want to kill the lights somehow? Or? The first, uh, my first stop, this is <coughs> South Carolina town, Orangeburg. Orangeburg used to be surrounded by cotton plantations, was one of the uh, larger and more um, uh, prosperous towns in South Carolina. This picture was taken right around noon, midday. This is the center of, uh, of, uh, of I'm sorry, of Orangeburg. Notable by, I didn't go out of my way to avoid taking a picture of anybody. They just simply weren't there. The next photo, this is taken around maybe 5 o'clock, a uh, work, uh, work day or a you know, weekday. Again, the absence of people. Uh, I thought this picture kind of summed up the, uh, the sad t state of, of uh, the town. Well, why? Well, what is Orangeburg today mostly known for? Thanks to this uh, bowling alley, this used to be a bowling alley. You can read it yourself. In 1968, uh, the, the bowling alley refused uh, entry to some black students of the local college there. And after a few days, they uh, had a peaceful, peaceful bonfire type of thing on the college campus. And as you can read, the uh, uh, Alabama State Troopers went in there, shot and killed three of them. Some 27 others were, were wounded, mostly in the back, running away from uh, uh, shotguns. The nine, there was nine uh, uh, troopers that were arrested. Uh, all of them were quickly acquitted. Only one person was found guilty and actually sentenced uh, to prison for something like three years. It was this uh, Cleveland Sellers, he was an acti uh, um, activist in that uh, movement, and uh, a black man, and because they said he started, he ended up that way. This is a fellow named Mark. Mark, uh, I met him on, this, on the street. I followed him a little bit later, and this is a soup kitchen. I met him, we talked more. Uh, Mark's a carpenter. The problem is there's no work. What he does do, there's a, a, not just he but others like him, there's an outfit out of Gainesville, Georgia that hires uh, contractors like him uh, when the big box retailers like a Costco or Walmarts build a facility, could be in Chicago, could be you know, any place across the country, they will hire somebody like him. But he's responsible for getting out to wherever that location is. So he, he lives with a friend in, uh, in Orangeburg. He's in the soup kitchen basically just to save money so that, you know, to minimize his, his cost because they used to, according to him, it used to be that when they would go, it would be a job for maybe six months, nine months, but more and more it's the job lasts only a couple of months and, you know, the, the fixed cost of getting out there has made it very difficult for him. Now, I spent a lot of time, I took him to dinner the next night and, again, this is one of the cases where I talk a lot about in the book. I, I, uh, I'm just trying to highlight some things that might be of interest uh, relevant to you. In his case, uh, the Texas Longhorn uh, sweatshirt, he was in Odessa, Texas last year, worked, worked there, uh, commented that, that, you know, they do a lot of fracking there. Not only could you not look, smell, you certainly couldn't even taste, uh, drink the water down there. Uh, he's in his mid-50s, and yet we talked at t times when he was a young teenager. Now, this would be like in the 80s, early 80s. He can recall in Orangeburg, the young black man, maybe uh, uh, you know a bunch of white guys uh, late on a Saturday night decided to have some fun. He can recall his friends of his being you know dragged on the back of a pickup truck, and uh, what was your recourse? As he said, you couldn't go to the police. And he made a comment that uh, I'll refer to further on in our talks as well. Uh, when we thought, well, that's just the southern way. Now we begin our now we begin our South uh, South Carolina trip. This 
though 301. Now, what you're going to see here, uh, we'll see a few of these. And I want to be the first to make the point, uh, certainly the South doesn't have a monopoly on places like this. We can go up across from Stone Ridge and you can see something like that here. However, the frequency and proximity of places like this is what, to me, sets apart this whole region. Uh, first, this is Bamberg. Bamberg, uh, small town. All these shops are pretty well closed up. The, the uh, railing here is fairly new, and I talked to somebody about that. That was put in uh, just to keep trucks and cars from driving up on the walk into the, uh, the stores. The stores are all pretty close. This is one of the storefronts I happened to take a picture of. I thought it, you know, re emblematic of a road, <laughs> road trip. But that's basically what it is. Going on from there, the next town, this is Allendale, uh, Faith Rivers. Uh, Allendale was at once actually a, a prosperous town because it's located, as was the case with the previous one, not that far from the U.S. Energy site. I think it's called the Savannah River site. Is a big facility not far from there that up until the end of the Cold War, 1989-1990, it was a big armament manufacturer mm -hmm. and employed several thousand people. It closed down and now it's basically a storage site for nuclear, uh, nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. Faith, uh, uh, first 19 years of her life, was born in, and grew up in New York with her mom. I went to school out there in the second year of college. Her mom died and uh, she had to come back here with relatives. So what does somebody that's lived in New York for 19 years, she's been back for three years now, she comes back and uh, entrepreneurial minded lady, she set up this, she mixes uh, oils and whatever, selling it on this street. I uh, met, met her twice, two different occasions, and both times somebody did come by and, you know, and buy uh, uh, a little bit what she's selling. But she just has such a, a spirit of enthusiasm I just love talking with her. <laughs> she kind of, kind of put me in my place. And one thing is <laughs> worth mentioning: when she was asking me what I, what I was doing there, I said, "Well, I'm, 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 I like to write a story, and I'm taking pictures and so forth." So, she actually had, a, she actually did some courses in photography as well. So she said to me, "She says, oh, so you're, a, you're a photojournalist?" Said, yeah, I, I don't know if I. It sounds kind of like an interesting thing. Yeah, I said, "I guess maybe I am." So then she says, well, if you are, why don't you go down to the projects and take pictures of the shootings that are going on down there? <laughs> and obviously, <laughs> uh, the next town is the post office, Sycamore. What kind of town would uh, require a post office of this size? <laughs> That's it. This is the center. This is the gas station of convenience store, which is you're going to see in Many of the small towns, they fit. that essentially is what the towns are. I'm saying, that's my car over here, I'm walking, there's a abandoned factory building behind me here, and, and that is Sycamore. The road scene, I thought it was interesting that the dog uh, <laughs> pet there had better facilities than whatever this was. Uh, quickly going through uh, Georgia, the Vidalia onions, uh, recognized. This picture I put in for no good reason. I was at a, a fair in Rhine, Georgia, a little tiny town, and I don't know, I just was captured by how well all the colors were coordinated here. <laughs> and no idea what she was saying to him or vice versa, but it just, <laughs> the photo just interested me. <laughs> I have to take it. Uh, now we're heading off this, you know, the red clay, Alabama. These are uh, catfish farms. Obviously, it used to be a big thing for years, much less of them because the, uh, a lot of that Farming has moved to Texas because of uh, economics as well as to, as well as to Mexico. Uh, the second time I went there was in the spring, so they're doing the aerating, as you can see, for the water. Uh, again, this is an example: uh, the haves and the have-nots. Uh, you own land, and you can live very well. This is, you know, the modern uh, grain elevators and so forth. Uh, beautiful places there. Uh, Alongside, this is probably it could be a hundred yards down from what you just saw on the opposite side. Uh, I show this because of what I mentioned the proximity. I, I won't show a lot of these, but I'm trying to make the point that I mean, here's a house that at least I would be happy living in if I was down there, and literally across the 
driveway or the lot, you've got something like this. And that is not an unusual sight to see through all of those states. Uh, the only town of any size that I did visit, which you're recognizing here, obviously, is going to be Selma. And I was there actually like five days before, don't forget they had the 50th anniversary of, of Bloody Sunday uh, in 2015. And uh, they were going to, you know, all the VIPs were coming and so forth. But I, I wanted to revisit. I was in Selma 10 years ago, and I was very, uh, very discouraged at the lack of, if you want to call it, progress in terms of uh, desegregation and, you know, feelings about uh, all of that. And I didn't, as I say, was really dis discouraged by it. So what would it be like 10 years later? Well, uh, in all fairness, this is, a, this is a Sunday morning, so you wouldn't expect to see a lot of people out there. However, like this Main Street here, that's what it is. And this is not an uncommon sight in Selma. The, the main hotel, uh, the St. James Hotel, where I took a, a picture of these three gals. I was kind of captured by the uh, saying on a uh, is on the receivership. So there's very little, little place to stay there. And uh, as I say, a few days later, the, um, uh, they all came in, did the ceremonies marking the 15th, and then everybody leaves, and that's it. And I don't know what Selma would be like in another 10 years. Uh, here are just, just a couple of closing uh, picture. This is obviously the bridge at, at sunset, and I guess I'm trying to show that in his, his stark uh, an area that they can still find some beauty. Uh, you know, obviously it's the bridge taken uh, well after sunset, and whether it would uh, to suggest some completion of a circle, I'm not sure, but I guess I, I just saw the beauty in it. Uh, every place can have that. Uh, I say every place, almost every place. Uh, this is um, the Fort Deposit Public Library, and this is Fort Deposit. What do we know about Fort Deposit? Probably don't know anything about it, <laughs> but Fort Deposit, along with Haynesville uh, and Lowndes County, back in 1965, Jonathan Daniels was a um, uh, Jesuit student in Cambridge. His family was from Keene, New Hampshire was down there uh, as part of a, a voting rights march, was with a couple others, including young teenage black girl uh, in the nearby town of Haynesville going into a corner store to get a Coke soda. Uh, they wouldn't allow her in there. They immediately called a, a volunteer deputy who proceeded to come, uh, aimed a shotgun at the girl. Jonathan Daniels stepped in front and was shot and killed. A good friend of mine, uh, Bill Sullivan, lives over in Wesley, a former professor at Keene State, has done an award-winning documentary on it, on that. And he highlights uh, the story and everything behind it. And rather interesting, uh, that later that summer, marking the 50th anniversary of that up in Keene, New Hampshire, they got to get together. This is Ruby Sales. She's the young gal that Jonathan Daniels stepped in front of and saved her life. She goes around still talking about it. I also met uh, one of the other fellows that was part of it. Uh, it's a, the, the movie itself is just very telling. Uh, it's interesting, uh, at the end of his movie, uh, a reporter interviews a young 20-something-year-old uh, uh, black uh, lady, a girl, and asked, because the, 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 the deputy that did it was quickly acquitted, he had no remorse even going to his grave a few years ago. He, and when they interviewed the, uh, the girl, uh, why, 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 such, why so quickly? Her answer was the classic answer, which I say I've heard it throughout the trip. It's just the southern way. Uh, the next town, this is Marion, Alabama, uh, actually the home of Coretta Scott King. Uh, it's, a, it's, the, it's because it's the, the uh, uh, county courthouse, it looks a little more impressive, but other than the courthouse, there's not a heck of a lot more there to, uh, uh, to speak to. Uh, again, down the street, they're re getting ready to co commemorating the anniversary as well. Uh, okay, what might Marion be most noted for these days? No? Jimmy Lee Jackson was a, a Baptist deacon uh, down... Uh, 
uh, on a voting rights march. And what happened with him? Well, uh, during the course of the march, a uh, deputy, a uh, state trooper, James Fowler, went up and, and shot him. That's it, killed him. It's, cons it's, it's suggested that this was the uh, uh, impetus for the uh, uh, march, the Selma to Montgomery march later that year. Are those bullet holes in the tombstone? Pardon? Are those bullet holes in the tombstone? Mm -hmm. It looks like it's I think it's shot. probably, I think it's what do you call it, um, uh, fungus or. You're talking over here? Right now. Oh, oh. well, uh, I'm not, <laughs> it could very well be. I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, the interesting thing is, there's James Fowler who, who committed the murder, pleaded guilty to manslaughter and received a lengthy prison sentence. You want to guess what year that was? 2010. Uh, the other, th this I want to talk a little bit about, the Lincoln School, this was a school started like 1867, it was actually started by a couple of, uh, right after the war, a couple of northern military men and a group of then f newly freed slaves as a means of a school to be able to provide education for the newly freed slaves. And uh, it became notable over the years for having graduated a number, including Coretta Scott King, but a number of them that went on to higher education and achieved advanced degrees. So it had quite a quite an enviable rep, uh, reputation in that regard. And uh, all that, of course, they closed down when they were going to integrate the schools. They closed down. All that's left is this gymnasium here. Mm -hmm. And uh, first time I went, I wanted to meet somebody that had gone to the school, and I was not successful. The second time around. Uh, again, what you go through to meet these people. Uh, and at one point, um, out there, and this fellow's coming by, uh, Jack here, and I mentioned, I said, see, I've been here several days on and off. How do I meet somebody that's attended this school back then? And he just simply said, well, you're looking at him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, there's a lot about him that I have in the book that I'm not going to cover here in the interest of time. But, you know, we talked about he graduated from there. He talked about the voting rights. And you've all heard about the, you know, how difficult, if not impossible, it would be for a black person to pass the, the test to be able to vote. And you hear all different, I've heard things on Oprah and so forth. His, he had an interesting one. One of the questions, how many bubbles in a bar of soap? Okay, what do we have here? We're leaving him this Grand gaming edifice to what? Where are we? Well, Pearl River Resort. I'll tell you where we are. Philadelphia. Not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Philadelphia of the movie Mississippi Burning. When these three black students, uh, I'm sorry, two, I'm sorry, where these three uh, civil rights activists, uh, two white, one black, were were murdered. You know the story, so I don't have to recount that. This is the Mount Zion United Methodist Church that uh, was depicted as burning down. All that remained of it was this bell. This was the, uh, the pastor, Peggy Gibson, uh, two years ago. This is Peggy along with this woman here. Her name is Evelyn Cole. If you remember in the movie, uh, they depict a scene of, it was her father actually, that was dragged out of the car of the house and beaten badly by the group of the Klan. Uh, never really recovered. He had neurological damage right up to when he died. But we talked, we talked about that. Uh, and in that particular area, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, Neshoba County, I think is, is the county, probably the most powerful of the Klan counties. And I bring that up because, you know, talking to her about when this happened, what about her mom and, and her other family? How did they... How did they, what was happening next? What were they worrying about? And it was interesting. She did share with me, and others in other places have said the same thing. They were not afraid. They had their, they had their rifles and their shotguns in their house, and they were, they meaning, you know, the, uh, the black families there were willing to do what they had to do to, to protect themselves and their family. Uh, 
Peggy made an interesting comment that I passed on. We're talking about the movie. Uh, one of my conversations with her, I said, I, I had heard that, you know, if you remember in the movie, the FBI was very uh, proactive in bringing justice there and so forth. And I said, I had heard that the FBI, the movie didn't fairly depict them, that it, you know, they were there, the name, uh, uh, Edgar Hoover wasn't the most, you know, he was certainly a segregationist. And she quickly admonished me and said, Something to say. I don't know where you get your stories from, but if it wasn't for the fact that the FBI offered a reward for any information leading to the whereabouts of the three uh, killed uh, young people, they never have found them. Okay. And in fact, she says it was, if anybody was driving around in a new car, <laughs> they were immediately suspect as the ones that, you know, so it was a very, <laughs> a very trying time for the, let's call it the innocents. Ah, now, where are we here? The Delta. The Mississippi Delta. Uh, Lyndon Bain Johnson was quoted uh, one time as saying, there's America, there's the South, there's Mississippi, and somebody quickly piped in, and then there's the Delta. I wanted, the only thing I'm going to, I want to read from my book is just a, a three short paragraphs that I wrote that I think sums up how I feel about, not just me, but how others feel about But let me just share this with you, and then we'll continue on. The Delta is also a mystical region that encapsulates a culture and a heritage of America as the birthplace of the blues, music that emanated from the struggles of mostly black sharecroppers and tenant farmers whose lives are one of hardship and poverty. Their soulful tunes and lyrics were stories, stories of their lives that would eventually make it to stages much larger than the cabinet porches, church pews, in prison cells. This blues music is the heart and soul of rock and roll. It crossed state lines, national borders, to become a global phenomenon. Music rooted in the lives, the pain, the trials, the tribulations, and rare moments and the joys of the heart. Physically, you can't put your arms around it, or even your mind around it, because it's a mood, an experience. It's been said that the Mississippi Delta Blues are a cry out for help, the bondage lifted, a freedom sought, and it was at the recording studios of Muscle Shoals, and I'll, I'll have a few pictures of that later on, talk much more about it in the book, <clears throat> that the blues sounds coalesce with the gospel and rock music of icons like Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, the Rolling Stones, and others. Uh, a Jackson Pollock? No, no, this is... <laughs> This is a cotton field that first light. But anyway, <laughs> for maybe a little bit of artistry. Uh, this is the Delta. This is the Delta. This is, uh, this is where you don't want to run out of gas or have a problem with your car, especially in the off season when, when nobody and nobody is around. The first, this is the town of Louise. And what you see is, is pretty much what you get. Used to be surrounded by cotton fields. There's still uh, uh, fields around there, mostly soy and maybe wheat. But you know, they're so mechanized now that there's just very little demand for, you know, for labor. Uh, one of them, in fact, I think it was, the, it was the Peggy Gibson that said, now, or no, it's somebody that's still to come. Now you can a, a business person can go out in their in their in their dress clothes and do the tractor, then go back into the office and do their thing. So the mm -hmm. the need for the need for help is is diminished. And consequently, you've got little towns like you know a town probably a hundred people in there, and uh, just a couple of scenes there. Uh, again, in a town like this, there's really only one place, just like you saw earlier. And that's the local, you know, the convenience store and so forth. And uh, this was a place, and I, uh, I stopped there and uh, introduced myself and we talked. This, uh, this actually is a, a father and son. Uh, Howard here, actually, a, a few years ago, uh, part of like a minister group. So he actually traveled to different parts of the country with a small church group. I think San Francisco one time, Chicago. So, I mean, here he is out in no man's land, the Louise, and uh, yet he's had, he's had that kind of uh, experiences. This is his son. Uh, I went back another time, I went back a second time and spent, spent a lot more time with his son. Uh, uh, son was, if you look at the previous picture, you'll see uh, he, 
is a Marine in Camp Lejeune, had a bad car accident, so he kind of lost his uh, lost the use of his arm there. Um, oh, but the other thing I want to point out, just, you know, when I stopped here, there was probably a dozen uh, fellows like this, all, you know, basically all African American. And what I do in a case like this, you know, I kind of go up very, you know, I'm looking for, is this the road to such and such? Well, I know it isn't, I don't really care, but it's the way to <laughs> establish some sort of dialogue with them. And, you know, we talk and I say, geez, I, you know, I'm, I'm t can I get a beer inside or something? And, and then anybody else want one. So you go in and they don't know, they didn't all necessarily want a beer, but the point is that by doing something like that, went in, shared it, and, you know, then for a couple hours you could talk about anything and everything, and you get a flavor for the people. You really do. Uh, what I did want to say about, not him directly, but because it ties in with some other things too, but uh, while I was there, I don't know if it was a friend of his or just an acquaintance came along, fellow, you know, in his 40s, and when he left, uh, this is Tim, his name is Tim, Tim says to me, yeah, you know that guy? He's had 28 children with 17 different women. So my first reaction, and he's still alive? <laughs> and he said, well, one, one of the women tried to do something. He says, but for the most part, they don't have a problem with that because the more children they have, you know, the more money they get from assistance. So it's a sad case. I have a, another friend, not in this state, who works as a volunteer in shelters like that. And in this particular state, which will remain unnamed, but it's a southern state, uh, she works and they have what they call every Monday is Mother's Day, meaning that when the checks come out to the mothers, the fathers are right down there looking to get their share of it to keep them out of jail or keep them out of this. And it's amazing to this, as this person is, is telling me, it's amazing how many of the women basically money over to the, the fella and they're right back to where they started. A sad, you know, sad situation. Ah, uh, now. Uh, reminds you of uh, North by Northwest. <laughs> I was, I saw this, uh, uh, the crop, uh, you know, the uh, duck crop dust had gone, and it was early in the morning, you can see by the light, and I was watching for quite, I got out of the car actually and walking, <laughs> and all of a sudden it's kind of coming towards me. <laughs> I was too far away from the car, so I just took a picture and hoped it would get above me. I think I got some of that, uh, but anyway. Uh, I put this in this in this um, frame, this moody frame, because of where we're going next. Uh, one of the most tragic stories of this region, of any region probably. Uh, and where are we going? This sign appears outside. I'll let you read it for a moment. Uh, you all probably know the story. Uh, there's a book, a uh, book just came out now, which you may, you may have it, The Blood of Emmett Till. Uh, Duke professor uh, 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 Timothy Tyson uh, just wrote that. And I'll show you a couple of, anyway. This is what the grocery store looked like at the time. This was it in 2015. And I was there two weeks ago, and this is what it looks like today. Uh, the professor, actually, he asked me for this picture, and there's another one coming up, that he wanted for his office and for when he does his book tours. He, 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 according to, he sat in front of his car, in front of this for like an hour, a couple hours, and just totally engrossed with the, the sadness of the story. But he apparently didn't have, well, I think what it was, he was there in the summer. If you're there in the summer, that Kudro, whatever you call that southern weed, it just encompasses it, so you can't see anything. Um, and I was there in February both times. Uh, next to that, oh, incidentally, that where you saw the thing is called Money, M O N E Y, that's the name of the unincorporated town now. Probably 50 people live there. Uh, near to that is um, uh, Glendora. Uh, Glendora is um, where, as you can read and assign, one of the two uh, brothers that committed the atrocity and who. A short time later, sold their story to a light Look magazine for, you know, twenty-five hundred dollars. So freely admitting to, uh, you know, what they had done. 
This was the uh, cotton gin where the, if you know the story, where they got the fan, the 75 pound fan to tie it around the body of Emmett Till when they dumped him into the, uh, this is the Tallahatchie River. Or, well, this is a, uh, to a kind of a, uh, an, o an overflow from the bayou from it, but it was dumped in there. Um, I thought this was kind of made it for a moving picture of that. And they, you know, they dragged his body out of it. Now, in, in both, uh, uh, both uh, Tyson's book, and also there's this Dispatches from Pluto, which is a very interesting book. Pluto is a small town like this in, in the Delta. And this well-known author, uh, what's his name, James Bryant, writes about it. In both cases, they detail in great detail, uh, they say in great detail what was done with Emmett Till, just how badly they did this, that, and the other thing. Uh, if a picture is worth a thousand words, I'm just going to, there's only one picture in here that I didn't take, and it's going to be the next picture, which was taken by a fellow by the name of uh, Jackson, uh, a photographer that took a picture. If you remember, what made, what made, if not worldwide, certainly countrywide news of that was that Emmett Till's mother insisted on having an open casket back in Chicago. That's it. His mother, a friend. This is also in Glendora. This is the Emmett. This is the um, interpretive center. It's, uh, life and times of Emmett Till. Fourteen years of it, anyway. And uh, when I met this this uh, woman in the middle here, uh, Desiree. And uh, this is uh, this part. I will want to tell you how I met somebody because I think it is interesting and relevant and one of the most one of the two most important or meaningful parts of my my boy, my trips there. Uh, when I was there I asked her, I said, how I want to meet somebody that, you know, this Emmett Till thing occurred in nineteen fifty five. So if I can meet somebody in their late seventies or eighties, uh, and she says, Well what just go across now Glendora is looks like Louise and money. There's nothing there, you know, worth photographing. And uh, she said, well, just go across the street. The mayor, Johnny, uh, Johnny B, he's known that, uh, he would be able to help you, but there should be. So I do. I go across the street. He's a big, burly uh, African-American. Introduce myself, tell him what I'm looking for. And he couldn't get rid of me fast enough. <laughs> no, they're all dead or gone. And I went back to Desiree, and uh, I said, yeah, I'm kind of discouraged. And she was, she was surprised. What I didn't know at the time, I only found out on a later trip, was you know, when the two brothers did what they did to Emmett Till, they had two or three African Americans driving the truck, cleaning out the blood, one of whom was apparently the father of the mayor. So obviously he wasn't interested in me further. In. So uh, this was a Saturday, and Desiree says, "Well, there's a woman, there's a woman that goes to church up in in uh, Tutwiler." Uh, she goes and she didn't go every Sunday, but she may she may go tomorrow. And I find out. I said, "Well, ask about the woman." Well, this woman, she would be in her late seventies. This woman, I erroneously said in a book that she worked in Brian's store. Uh, that's wrong. She actually worked in a store that the bro the mother of the two brothers that committed the heinous crime had, but she also worked on occasion for the mother, a babysitter, a housekeeper. She was with the mother the next day when they called to tell her what they did. Got to meet her. I had, been, I had been trying to go up in a plane to take photographs of the Delta, you know, aerial pictures. And one day with the weather, the next day the pilot didn't show up, the next day there was a problem with the plane. The next day, Sunday, was a going to be a glorious blue sky, and here I am. I got to go up in it. But no, uh, I got to see if I can meet this woman, Christine Wheeler. So I uh, canceled my plane thing. Uh, this is the uh, beautiful. This is the beautiful part of downtown Tutwiler. This is the more realistic part. This is the remains of a, uh, the funeral home where Emmett Till's body was first brought, first bought before it managed to get out up into uh, uh, up to uh, Chicago. This is the church, Good Hope Church in Tutwiler. And I went to it. Now, as I'm telling this next story, keep in mind what happened a little more than a year ago in, in, in Charleston, South Carolina. The young 
young boy going into a Bible study. That's what I'm doing. I got there early. I go in there. The only difference, I'm carrying a tape recorder. He obviously was carrying that. So I go in there, and there's maybe six or seven people. Uh, there's three women, I think four, four guys, and it's a Bible study. And I get there early, and I say, oh, I, I wanted to go to a church service. Well, it doesn't start for a while, but please join us. So I did. I sat back a few rows, so my tape recorder wasn't in any use, but that's okay. And the subject of that Bible study was love and forgiveness. And one of the women, she didn't talk often. When she did, she was so damn articulate. And she would comment, like, you know, I know what it's like to hate. I've been down that road. Uh, that's not God's way. You've got to go. And she, again, she said it far better than anything I could say. And I said, that's got, that's got to be Christine. No sooner did the service end, this woman gets up, walks over to me. Hi, I'm Christine Wheeler. Uh, spoke with her, had a, uh, spoke with her after that, went to a church service with her. Uh, she introduced, uh, we talked a little bit before, so she introduced me to the uh, congregation. Uh, unfortunately, her husband had just died like two months before that. Husband of 57 years. So uh, I wasn't able to get into a lot with her, and nor did I want, well, it was a Sunday and so forth. But I went back, you know, saw her again and again. And this is her two weeks ago. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more, but doing a, I want to do a story about her. Uh, I think she is just, just the most remarkable one. I've got about five hours of, of tape that Bibi is trying to take off that and write it down so I can use her words. I don't know how, quite, quite how I'm going to do that. But uh, she, uh, she went out to, she was 17 years old at the time. Uh, married at that time, went out to San Francisco for many years, then, then came back. But we've had, you know, more than I can cover in this talk. And one of the questions that I had asked of her was, um, how was it, what was it like before the Emmett Till and after Emmett Till in terms of how, you know, people of your color viewed it? And she gave me a kind of a surprising answer. She says, Emmett, Emmett Till was, was not a big deal. If the rivers, if the waters of the earth could talk, there's thousands of Emmett Tills there. Mm -hmm. What it was simply that the mother had the courage to show the body the way it did. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's much more certainly about her than I could cover here, and I'm and there's more about her in the book and more I like to do. But just a, a, a remarkable lady. Uh, near uh, nearby mm -hmm. Sumner. This is Sumner, Mississippi. This is the courthouse. It, it's being re. Uh, it has been renovated to replicate what it was back in 1955. This is where the trial was held uh, for the two uh, killers of uh, Emmett Till. Uh, this is Cliff Chandler. Cliff actually, unfortunately, just passed away this past year. He's 80, 82 or 83, but he, I spent a lot of time with him on a couple of trips. He actually attended, he, he is a volunteer, there's an Emmett Till Center right in Sumner. And he's a volunteer there. He goes, well, he attended every day, the trial only lasted a week, but he attended every day of the trial of uh, the Emmett Till killers. And many, many stories to tell. Um, interesting, you know, the, the um, they, they were quitted quickly. I think it took like an hour, and one of the jurors rather, you know, facetiously said, well, if we didn't have a, a soda break, it would have taken sooner. Uh, you know, a, just a terrible, uh, terrible tragedy. But he, you know, Cliff had so much to, to contribute. On that. And incidentally, the, uh, the town of Sumner back in 2007, and I, I think I reproduced it in my book, issued like an edict, an apology to the Till family for whatever role that Sumner played in the injustices. Uh, this is uh, Mary Johnson. Mary Johnson was a court clerk there. Wonderful conversations with her. She was a former uh, sharecropper, and the stories that she had to tell of her days uh, sharecropping were certainly enlightening and interesting. Here's her two weeks ago. Uh, sadly, her, her son, 
just several months ago, her son was killed, was murdered, and this, this is her son's son, her grandson, and this is two nieces that she recently adopted. Uh, this picture I took her, I took her to lunch in Clarksdale, which we'll get to a little bit later on. Uh, but a, a, wonderful, a wonderful lady that's uh, uh, struggling with the, with the loss of a child, which, you know, is just an unbearable. Uh, now, as I say, we can't, I, I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time, a lot of time on this, but uh, just quickly, uh, again, because the blues, the music is so integral to that era, uh, this is in a small, small town in, uh, in the Delta, one of the last of the juke joints, poor monkeys on, out in the middle of no place. It's open only on Thursday, it was open only on Thursday nights. Uh, the gentleman in the middle here is there, that's him up close, <laughs> Willie. He's just 74 years old. He also died this past year, unexpectedly. He's, he's a farmer, but uh, he runs this place here, incidentally, is, you know, Andy Leibovitz has done photo shoots there, New York Times has had some, it's quite well known. Again, only, open only on Thursday nights. And it attracts quite a, you know, one time I was there, there's a group of Swedes, Swedes there, another time. So it's quite, it's quite well known. It's way out in the middle of no place, and uh, you, there's no lights, and when you get rain and storm, let me tell you, it's a challenge getting back from there. Uh, there's beauty out there, too. I Just a couple of pictures near sunset leaving there, the grain mills. Crossroads, uh, we're coming into Clarksdale now, and this, uh, this is the famous sign where the legendary uh, Robert Johnson was alleged to have sold his soul to be able to play a mean guitar. Uh, unfortunately, a member of the so-called 27th Club, he was, uh, well, let me put it this way. Uh, we have, in Stonington, we have another legendary musician, Charles Ho Charlie Holland, you probably all know him. <laughs> and apart from music, Charlie has not quite something in common. He hopes to, though, because one of Charlie's many one-liners, well, he doesn't have many, he just repeats them all the time, but this particular <laughs> one is, he actually says, you know, you know how I want to die? I want to be shot by a jealous husband. <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened with Robert Johnson. He was actually poisoned by a, a jealous husband. But he only got to be 27. Uh, I went back the next year, and this fella obviously made it into my book. Ground Zero Blues Club uh, is kind of the leading blues club in Clarksdale. It's co-owned by uh, the mayor there, Bill Luckett, and uh, Morgan Freeman, the actor. Uh, this is at uh, the time of the, they do a, uh, in April they have a, a Duke Joint Festival. Very, you know, very well attended, quite a lively place. This is outside the, uh, the club. This is inside. And from a couple of weeks ago, if you look closely at the bouncer, here's the back of Bill Luckett. He's with Morgan Freeman and Morgan Freeman's longtime girlfriend. And there's Mark Zucker and his wife Priscilla. Oh my heavens. Uh, they were there. Uh, they're doing a, uh, I want to tour all 50 states, but obviously they're doing it in sections. And Morgan Freeman had done some work for Facebook. And I wanted to meet him. I, I didn't mention it with, with Christine Wheeler. Christine is from the same town, uh, Charleston, Mississippi, as where Morgan Freeman's ranch were. And there was some question, did they go to the same school at the same time, blah, blah, blah. And it gets into a little story. But I wanted to, I wanted to meet him to talk to him about Christine. And I did get that, I did get that chance uh, one of these days past. But anyway, they were there. Uh, the uh, Zuckerbergs brought in this. Uh, his name is Super Chickens, he spells a C-H-I-K-A-N, and he travels rather widely with, uh, with his group. And uh, the Zuckerbergs brought them in, uh, paid for the entertainment, paid for all the, all the food that evening in the place. And pay, uh, so it was, it was really kind of an interesting evening. Uh, I just show this just in passing. This, his name is Kingfish. He's, he's 18 now, but uh, I met him when he was 16. He, when he was 14, he played at the Obama White House. He plays, um, this is not an area that I'm all that familiar with, but he plays a kind of a Jimi Hendrix type of guitar, if you know what that means. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's only about five feet two oh, wow. and weight and you know, an enormous 
and his 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 act is a very lively one too. And given his look, so I, when I saw I had lunch with Bill Luckett, the, the mayor, and Bill's good friends with the, the, his mother. And I asked, I said, "How has Kingfish been doing?" And he just said to me, kind of disgusted, he said, "Well, last time I saw him, he had an oxygen mask on his face, mm -hmm. and he's gotten heavier." Mm -hmm. And apparently, his mother insists on managing him, which she shouldn't do. And I guess there's another story. But anyway, here's somebody that appears to be a great talent, and it's question as to whether he'll ever get out of his teens. Mm -hmm. Now I'm leaving the leaving the Delta. This is the eastern sky during a sunset. And this is the morning I left the Shack Up Inn, which is a place to stay. And now we're crossing, crossing the uh, Tennessee River going, uh, I mentioned, you know, just, just a few pictures. I got a lot more in the book, but, you know, Muscle Shoals, uh, this was where you see the names on it. This goes back to the 1960s and later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the famous, uh, this is where, uh, I'll see if you recognize, do you recognize who that is? <laughs> Willie Nelson. <laughs> uh, I took pictures of pictures. I were on the wall. I thought, do you find this interesting? My good friend and, and uh, uh, financial, uh, uh, somebody that always delves in finances, Mark Ginsburg says, God, they got a good return on their investment. $980 to do two albums. Here's the album, the other one. You recognize Wild Horses, yeah. Brown Sugar. Yeah. Even Cher got into it. She was cheaper. <laughs> uh, anyway, there's more about it. I, I'm, I'm going to finish up with a, a story that I'm taking you kind of back a bit. And the story uh, is not this this place. This is Eufaula, Alabama, and there is a story in the book about the place. And so, but what I want to share with you is not in the book. There's a reason for it. But uh, in addition to meeting uh, Christine, uh, my experience here might have been the most meaningful for me on uh, on the entire journey. Uh, Eufaula here, you see, this is just coming from Georgia into Alabama. Now you've seen the types of towns I've been going through. And I'm coming into it first, it was kind of at night, because it was in February, you know, uh, it gets dark early. And I'm coming down a, a kind of a tree-lined boulevard with, with, with really nice houses on there. And I come into the town. Again, it's dark, but I see there's a, a restaurant lit up. And all I'm doing is really looking for a place to eat. And what do you know? I find a, a restaurant that makes my kind of cocktail, this sort of steak. <laughs> and given the type of places I've been going to, I mean, this is... <laughs> get any better than that. I just uh, just got a place for the night that one night and moved on. But the next time I came, I had to. I want to know why. Why was you full of dinner? What was about it? So uh, later, a couple months later, this is the uh, uh, is one of the mansions. This is called the Shorter Mansion, but it's the home of the Eufaula uh, Heritage Society. It's a very active society. And in fact, the uh, 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 Pam Sneed, who's the director, when I did my talk at the Mystic Noack Library last year, uh, she 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 came up and, and you know was a participant. Oh. Anyway, I went uh, went her and then spent. Uh, this is a uh, Miss Lucy, 95 year old lady, goes way back in heritage, uh, former teacher and prolific traveler, and had a wonderful wonderful experiences with her as well. But uh, what, I'm, what I want to get to here is that when I went the second time, I went, I, first thing you do any place, you go to a library. That's where you're going to find out what's going on in the town. And I did. And uh, you follow the librarian uh, gal, maybe in her 50s, but she can remember back to the 80s. She remembers the theater, the segregated theater, and so forth. And there was a, a manuscript written, uh, uh, William Morris. Uh, Willie Morris, uh, 60 years in Eufaula, Eufaula's name of the town, and he recounts, you know, over 60 years, he's a black man, uh, the lynchings, the seg all the things that basically you accepted as being part of the, <coughs> the community like that when you're, when you're a person of color. And uh, then a subsequent book came out, 60 years, uh, uh, no, it called uh, Inju Witness to Injustice. 
And I mentioned that for a reason I get to. It's a, a, a book. The first one I mentioned was only two copies. One was in library. But anyway, I got a, I got a good sense of, of you fall. And then I, when I went to the, I went back to the mansion. I spent some time. Pam showed me some different places, and I and I, I bought a book when I was there. And the book was called Candid Comments, and it's the it's columns the Ufola Tribune. This was the editor of the Tribune. From 1958 to 2006, God, what a you know wealth of information. So I bought it, brought it back with me. Meanwhile, I'm I'm kind of learning that Eufaula was the last was the last township in Alabama to integrate their schools. And I checked, and there was some some court uh, uh, <coughs> some suits uh, that went on, uh, a couple of newspaper articles from a larger. Uh, one of the larger Alabama newspapers, and uh, so I, and I looked through the book. I, I looked through it first quickly, not not that much. But then, as I'm reading more about, I'm already home now. This is probably May, June, even maybe, and uh, I'm reading about it. And I go through the whole book, and I've got a lot of things marked, but not one <laughs> iota of word, phrase, or anything suggests anything but a seamless, you know. Everything is just hunky dory, so perfect. I mean, Eufaula is a model of how all these things occur, and I couldn't reconcile that with uh, with what I've been read. So what I so what I did was I sent a now Pam, who you met, Pam, uh, although she's been in Eufaula a long time, she didn't get there till like the late '80s, so she wouldn't have <coughs> any knowledge of you know before that. But I, I sent her a, I sent her an email. And in the email, uh, I brought this up. I said, Pam, I don't understand. Uh, I'm reading about this and that. And in Joel's, Joel's book, I see no reference to it. So, of course, she doesn't know but what she does. She sends my email on to about a half a dozen other people there, including the widow of Joel Smith. So I get back, the first email I get back is from his widow. Her name is Anne. And she writes very, you know, very kind. She says, "Gee, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Everything I remember was smooth. You know, whatever her words were, they were. You know. So, what, what, what is your source? Is her question. So, in his, I didn't, when trying to put her on the spot, I gave her specifics: uh, this court ruling, this newspaper article, this and that, and so forth. Just so back. <laughs> I probably uh, an hour later, I get an email back. I got to know more about you. Until then, we can have no further correspondence. Then I started getting a couple other emails back. And along the lines, I you know, it won't go through all, but basically just saying, oh, you've got to come back down here. Now, <laughs> why do they want me to come back down there? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> now it's getting to be July. You know, it's 100 degrees down there. What am I going to get? But you know, I just, I just had to know what this was all about. So I did. I went back down there in July, and I actually met. I met with Ann, with his widow. Uh, met with a fella, uh, not that it's germane to my discussion. Met with a fella in his late 80s, living down there with his wife. Went to the Princeton, the uh, uh, the, the what's the institute that, where Einstein. He had John. Um, what's the uh, physicist that died tragically? They made the movie about him. John. Yeah. Yeah. John, John Nash. Uh, he had two courses with John Nash. He had lectures with Albert Einstein. Just to, again, having nothing to do with, although we did get into Ufola, but just met some very interesting people like that. Uh, and talked more with Pam about it, met some other ones. And now, and I'm not, I'm not getting what I wanted, really. And I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to go about it. But Pam, she, she said, okay, you know, you're going to be here a couple of we're going to arrange, uh, this is in the mansion, this is just one, I just took it with my cell phone there. Uh, we're going to we'll arrange a get-together. We'll have, uh, these are the first two, uh, and her husband, her first three black students to attend a integrated school in Eufaula. This is one of the teachers at the time. There's about f uh, half a dozen others sitting around, the state senator, an African American, the principal who would have been in his late 80s, uh, was there. Um, 
two other executives, so it's maybe about a dozen people that she makes us arrange. We can, you know, we can have uh, soft drinks, wine, cheese. She says, we're going to have a get together and we're going to talk about it. Or you're going to do whatever. So uh, we do that. So, and I knew that the night before, and I'm wondering, how do I, uh, how, how do I address this? I don't want to be confrontational. Gee, this is what I heard, Tom <coughs> And finally, I'm, I'm sitting in the chair, still not completely sure. We're doing some socializing. And then Pam introduces me. Um, it's interesting, she, uh, not, don't, I'm not doing this for ego purposes. She brought out these two books, which I did. I think she was trying to give me some credibility with these people that knew who I was. But anyway, we're sitting there, and finally I just said, you know, I kind of looked all around. And I says, take me back to your fall of, of a half century ago. And uh, a black, the, the black senator, he first starts, and he's very animated, and he kind of starts off, well, you know, we uh, went to school, it was this, uh, and he's probably not a minute into his conversation when this <laughs> vice senator, when he says something along, he says, I don't know where you went, I don't know what school you went to, but I remember walking along those roads when it was raining and hailing, those buses never stopped to pick me up. Well, without getting into the rest of the country, that's kind of what opened things up. And then you started hearing different dialogue, different. The principal, who was probably the most, uh, I, let's say, mentally challenged, he was older and maybe had some. And as he's hearing these things, he's saying very little, but you had a sense, I truly didn't, you had a sense that he was feeling whether it's remorse, he was feeling terrible. He was hearing things that he didn't think was that way at the time. And you, you kind of felt bad for him. Uh, anyway, it continued. We probably, you know, for an hour, an hour and a half. And, you're, and again, it's going a lot of this back and forth. So it finished. And, and uh, it was, of course, late at night. And Pam thought it went wonderful and so forth. And already made a, made a, a comment. One of them, uh, one of them at the time I was there said, how could we haven't done this before? And then the next morning, when I was uh, talking, somebody says, uh, we've got to do more of this. And what was interesting during part, of, when I mentioned to you, I mentioned that book, A Witness to Injustice, which is written by a local, all about your folk. You'd be surprised how many of those people didn't even know about the book. Uh, so, so anyway, so we left. And then I'm, I'm driving back home and, you know, say my goodbye. And what do I do with this? And I felt that, I felt that these people were hearing and saying things they hadn't done their whole life. And it had, it had meaning to them. But when I got back, I, I, said, uh, I or sent an email to Pam, and I know what the reaction was. I said, something like, I said, Pam, I talked, you know, a little bit of stuff, I said, Pam, I don't want to. I don't want to use any of this in my book. I feel that it was a kind of an intimate, personal exchange. But I didn't know what she, I didn't know what she was going. I know how they're going to feel. And she comes right back with the same thing. I agree. Please don't. This was just what you said. So anyway, uh, with that, so that's the way it ended. And as I say, between my experience with that group and certainly with uh, with Christine, that it. Uh, became really so much a part of, of my trip. And, you know, that whole area of the South, just to finish, I'm just all finished. Um, I read a little bit about the Delta. You know, I've, and I don't mean this in an ego way, I've traveled all around the country, been to all 50 states, I've obviously been to four, 54 of the 58 national parks, I've been to the grandeur of the West. There's something about the Mississippi Delta. It just really, uh, never get tired of going back there. And it may be the blues is what attracts people, but you know, the people, the people, really just really, again, I met him in a certain context, so maybe it's different. Uh, if I was a woman, would I go up to a dozen African Americans in a small town? I don't know. Uh, but really, the, it just speaks so well, and keep in mind what these people have lived through and so forth. So anyway, I, that finishes my thing. If there's any questions, uh,